If you're looking for private placement programs and oil and gas, direct participation programs, uh, DPPs, oil and gas investments, energy sector private placements, or oil drilling partnerships, uh, you, you found the right place. I'm going to have my geologist, Kevin Fowler, discussing our current 40 well program. But before moving forward, I want to make sure it's clear that this is for educational purposes. Uh, oil and gas is uh, has a high degree of risk and uh, you have to be accredited to be investing in oil and gas programs. Without further ado, uh, let's get into this thing. Hey guys, uh, Sean Pruitt here. I have uh, geologist Kevin Fowler here. Say hello, Kevin. Hello, everybody. Good to see you today. Or <laughs> today we're going to be discussing a an oil and gas program, a forty well oil and gas program, and the reason why I have a geologist here, the importance of a geologist. Uh, it, without a geologist looking at an oil deal, it's similar to uh, you getting a CAT scan and not having a radiologist go over that information with you. It is imperative uh, to have a geologist look at the deal uh, for you. And uh, Kevin has evaluated this program and he put together this information that we're going to be uh, uh, discussing today. Um, and so the, the, the role of a geologist is that they explore and analyze potential oil and gas reserves. They use geological and geophysical data to locate and assess oil and gas deposits. They conduct surveys and drill exploratory wells to gather information. They evaluate the quality and quantity of hydrocarbon reserves. They provide recommendations for drilling and extraction strategies, and they interpret geological data to reduce exploration risk. Okay. And so um, I have Kevin Fowler here. He was the senior geologist for two multi-billion dollar oil companies, Hunt Oil Company and Marathon Oil Corporation. And so I'm going to uh, have him uh, uh, guide us in this oil project. And this oil program, it's, uh, it, it offers uh, a tax deduction uh, and, and, and the, the ancillary benefit is a tax deduction, no different than giving it to a charity. But the, you don't just get a tax write off, you also get uh, what's called oil revenue. And so I'm going to be in, in a lot of these videos, I discuss that in other videos. This is, we're more focused on explaining the project. If you're new to oil and gas, Kevin is going to take you down the road of teaching you about an oil and gas program and understanding of why we chose this location. And if you're interested in hiring Kevin, if you have a massive oil program, uh, you can reach out to me and I'll get you con in contact with them. But if you just have a little project you're looking at, and he's looking at, uh, and you want him to look at some of the logs, uh, by all means, I, I could connect you with him. He could save you from a lot, a lot of heartache as he has done for me. So, all right, guys, uh, um, uh, say hello, Kevin, and, and uh, show us uh, the ropes here on this oil deal. Yes, hi, everybody. The uh, West Five Mile Project is a 40-well shallow oil project in southwestern New York, right north of the Pennsylvania border near the city of Olean, O-L-E-A-N. Now this has been an oil productive area for about 140 years and was the first area in which uh, oil was ever exploited in the world. Um, since, this, since the first exploration of oil in the area, there's been continuous drilling of shallow oil wells with the main difference from the rest of the country being that when we drill wells in this area, as, as interesting as it may sound, but true, we will always, always find oil and gas. Now, this is different from other areas where you might drill wildcat wells like uh, Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, in which I've been heavily involved over the years. But we don't have the risk of, of having to find a trap or an underground anticline or some sort of a formation that will trap oil. It's present essentially everywhere in this area. Now, people ask, why hasn't it all been drilled up? Well, a lot of it has been. And um, Sean, if you want to open the book real quickly and show them page eight, we'll show them the density of drilling in the area that we're operating. Page eight is a map that shows not only our lease. Sorry. No, this is great. Okay, 
Yeah, page eight shows our current drilling lease being the two uh, orange colored areas that uh, surround a producing oil field. Now you can see all the green dots in the area, all the blue dots in the area, they're all oil wells. And they have been drilled in this area since about 1940, 1950. Uh, the main difference in the last 30 or 40 years has been that previously the wells were drilled down to about a thousand feet. And there was a uh, uh, literally a load of dynamite lowered down next to that pay zone that they drilled through approximately at the correct depth. The dynamite was set off and that was in effect a primitive frack that helped break up the rock and bring oil into the wellbore. Now, since uh, the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, wells out here have been hydraulically fracked, uh, uh, fracked with a mixture of water and sand propant and some clay stabilizing chemicals that are much more efficient in exploiting oil and taking it from the rock than the old methods were. And those methods have gotten even better since the uh, early 80s when they really became popular out here. Okay, now, Sean, if you would uh, zoom in on our map a little bit and go to page 12. Now, if you look at the map at the top of the page, you'll see a bunch of wells with numbers on them between the two properties that comprise the West Five Mile project that we will be drilling. These wells were drilled in the mid 80s. It's called the Potter Field Project. Um, as you can see, uh, because you see no dry hole marks on this field, every well that was drilled in Potter Field Project produced oil and gas. Now, we obtained some production records from the original operator of this lease. They weren't for the entire life of the wells, but they didn't need to be necessarily. They show first 90 days production of of the number of wells we have here, I think it's 13 wells, and then they show the first year's oil production. Now, at today's price of maybe $75 a barrel for oil, um, and the drilling price on this program, which is $192,500 a well, you will pay out a well in about a year's time at current oil prices and current drilling cost. Now, we can say that with confidence because if you look at, uh, for instance, well 15 on this chart and look to the right, you'll see first year's oil production was 3,781 barrels and first 90 days were 1,880 barrels. That means for the first 90 days, the well made about uh, 20, 22 barrels of oil per day. And in the first year's time, the well had produced enough oil essentially to pay it off at today's prices of oil and today's cost of drilling. Now, the interesting thing about that is these wells produced from either two or three of the pay sands that are available in the area. They did that to cut costs on their frack operation and just to make the wells uh, uh, completable more quickly. Um, we are going to be drilling and completing in six different pay sands that are a little bit deeper than these wells were drilled. But even at that uh, completion number of six different pay sands, as opposed to two or three in the old Potter field, we'll be able to realize, um, certainly we think, better production the first year than the wells did in Potterfield for which we have record over their first year. Let me, let me, means, you, let me uh, ask you for our audience to make yeah. sure that everyone's understanding. Um, so in the, in the 1980s, they didn't have today's fracking techniques, correct? But if they were able to produce 3,700 barrels of oil the first year out of two to three zones with 1980s fracking techniques, I can imagine that we could do better with five to six zones with more modern uh, fracks. Is that the case? Absolutely. Absolutely. And people say, what are more modern fracks? How are they different? We have the completion records for wells in this area. 
And what we notice about their fracks is that they put in a lower, lower volume of water and a lower number of pounds of sand into the formation over a shorter period of time. Now, what this shows me is that they're not reaching out into the formation to reach all the oil they can. They're putting in less water than we do now, less sand to hold the fracks open once the fracks are established, and they're doing it for a shorter period of time. So they're not driving what they have back into the formation as far as we do today. Now, we talk about a frac radius, which is how far out from the well we will reach out and grab the oil that we can produce. We estimate the frac radius of wells in this era to have been about 200 feet in all directions. The frac radius we can count on now is about 300 to 350 feet. Um, and with a higher concentrate or concentration of water and frac sand, we can open more fractures in that 300, 350 feet, and we can hold them open and uh, we can exploit considerably more oil pay than the wells drilled uh, in the 1980s. Additionally, we can aim the frack better. We can get it exactly where we want it vertically within the well because we are using uh, the same machinery to frack the well as we did when we logged the well, as we did when we found the original pay sands. That way we know we are fracking exactly the same footage that we saw when we logged the well and actually located the oil pay sand. This is precision that was not often employed in the 1980s. I know and, because and Let I, me make sure the audience understands why we need a frack. You don't, yeah. you're not just simply sticking a straw underneath the ground, finding a reservoir full of oil, like a swimming pool. Okay. Yeah. If it was that easy, uh, one hose into the, the pool, you could just pump it out. No problem. The oil is sitting in uh, a cavity, uh, a sandstone, if you will. And the sandstone, uh, uh, has porosity, what, five or 6%, Kevin? It can be an, in this area as much as uh, eight or 10%. Um, what the difference is though, uh, people conceive of, a, of an oil well going down to a pool of oil and pumping it up. Actually, our reservoirs, our pay sands out here are as hard as the concrete in your driveway. Um, this, this is a very old reservoir, uh, over 400 million years old in the Devonian, from the Devonian era. And we need to crack that sand open. It has the pore space. It has the space within the sand that contains oil and gas. What our task is, is breaking the rock open, that very hard concrete light rock open, so that we can exploit and recover the gas and oil that is present, that are present, rather. And uh, that is not a problem for modern fracks. We can be pretty sure of getting, of, of getting a, an economic recovery out of Almost any sand that contains oil, no matter how permeable it is, that is to say, no matter how hard and resistant to flow that sand is, we can crack it up enough so that we can introduce the ability within that sand to flow oil and gas. Understood. Okay, I would like now to go to, uh, we'll look at one of the logs that is in this field and we'll go over exactly uh, basically how you look at an oil and gas log. What we've uh, done now is we pulled up the title page of a log that is actually within the Potter Field. This is one of the wells that was drilled in the 80s um, that made a respectable and economic production even back then and even from only a couple of zones. Now, if you go to the, um, the next page, Sean, page 29, what, what, I'm, what I'm doing here is I am going from the, the shallowest oil sand in this well down to the lowest oil sand in this well. And you'll notice that most of the sands that contain oil and gas in this well were not produced. They weren't fracked, they weren't exploited, and there was never any oil or gas taken from many of the sands in this well. Now, how do we know that this well or uh, this sand contains oil and gas? If you look at the pink outlined areas that I have, and there are two of them on this page, this is actually a computer generated log that shows, actually indicates the presence of oil and gas. Now on the left hand side, the farthest left track, every time you see it cut it to the left, that's indicating a sandstone. 
Anything other than a sandstone in this well is shale. Now, uh, for our purposes and um, in this area, shales do not contain oil or gas, not until much deeper. But we're looking at wells that are 2,000 feet or shallower. And in this area, every sand below about 650 feet will contain oil and gas if it is if it has the porosity to hold it now if you look under the the orange square that says bradford first sand 13 feet net that's 13 feet thick of oil and gas pay and uh you essentially um look at a at, at a house that uh is one story tall and take it to the, the peak of the roof. That's how much oil sand right here was passed up. Now, if you go down right below it, the cherry growth sand has nine feet of oil sand in it. These were not exploited by this well. Okay, go down to, to the next page, please, Sean. 29. On page 29, uh, we see the chipmunk sand, 24 feet thick, which was produced in this well. I think that was one of the... Uh, uh, two named reservoirs that are picked up. Okay, now down below that is another sand called the Bradford Second, which is a nice 12 foot thick oil sand down at about um, 11, there you are right there, uh, about 1140, 1150. That is an oil sand that was not touched in this well. Okay, page 30. Now here are two sands, the Harrisburg Run um, altogether, we have 10 feet of oil pay here that was not touched in this well in Potter Field. Never fracked, never produced. Now go down uh, to the bottom of page 30, Sean, that same page. Okay, that's the Bradford Third Sand. That is the, the main uh, or the thickest consistently producing sand in this area. Now on the right, you'll see the, the black that is blacked in within the pink area. Um, and quite obviously and intentionally, that is indicating where oil will be found in the sand. Um, you have the porosity of approximately uh, 10 to 12 percent, which means that 10 or 12 percent of that sand has void space that is filled with oil and gas. And then you have the thickness of the sand noted from top to bottom. And we only count the part that is marked in black as carrying oil. That's called the net sand. And it's uh, 23 feet in this case. Now, of all the sands I showed you, this well produced only the chipmunk sand and the Bradford third. We're going to produce every other sand that is available in the well in addition to the chipmunk sand and the Bradford third. So you saw the ones they passed up. We're not going to pass these up. Now, you'll see that the well is, uh, I think it's about 1,900 feet deep. And the wells here are not deep. That, that is good because we can drill them quickly in a cookie cutter manner. And, and every of the 40 wells will be drilled. And every investor in this project has a part of all 40 wells. Um, the advantages of that, of course, are if, if you're diversifying where your production is coming from on a lease, if, uh, if, if one well throws a fan belt at the motor or has to be maintained for some other reason, you hardly notice the break in production. This is not like a one or two well deal where if one well goes down, um, you lose 50% of your, of your uh, oil and gas revenue for that period of time. With a 40 well program, you're, you're pretty well uh, guaranteed consistency in production. Um, people ask me, well, it's fine. It made, if it makes 3,700 barrels the first year, what does it do the years after that? In this book that we have put together that we think represent very realistic economics, I took that well from Potter Field. I took the production it made which was 3,700 uh, barrels the first year, or 3,800, I rounded it up. And then I put that as my production for the first year from one of our wells. And then if you decline the well at the, the rates that we are accustomed to out there, you will see that the first payout will be 
at about 13 months, but $75 a barrel based on that actual well that produced in the lease between our two properties in only three pay sands. Now, by the end of year two, you have had um, another year to produce. Of course, all wells decline over time, just like uh, everywhere in the world. But we anticipate a second payout of the well uh, between the, the well's 37th month and its 44th month. So sometime between its third and fourth year. Um, and depending on the price of oil, we can anticipate a third payout of the well approximately four to five years after that. I want to, I wanted to uh, remind the people that are watching. Um, I pulled up the map here, of the Potter oil field, and then our lease. And so Kevin is explaining the production from this lease right here, the Potter oil field. Uh, and we're drilling 40 wells between this lease and this lease right here. And he is explaining, he, he extrapolated, uh, the production from a well from the Potter oil field, and he applied that to the hypothetical. Um, and so uh, I, I just want to make sure you understand that the numbers are coming from actual production to an adjacent lease. Yep. Um, and they're not, hey, this is what we think they're going to do. This is actual real production data. That's exactly right. And um, I've been involved in this area since um, the 1990s. Uh, people ask me how long these wells are likely to, la to last. I'm still getting royalties from wells that we drilled in 1994. Um, and we had a total of about uh, 35 to 40 feet of pay sand in the wells from which I'm receiving royalties uh, across the line in Pennsylvania, uh, just carbon copies of many of these, except these wells in New York have more pay than the wells we drilled. We're looking at these wells having around 90 feet of net pay per well. And we can prove that with logs we have in the immediate area. So we're not estimating the amount of net pay. Um, we're not assuming a production that could happen. We're using a production that did happen. And I can state the longevity of these wells being um, 30 years or better. Uh, we quote 20 in the book uh, because we enjoy under promising and over delivering. Uh, I think that's a, that's a better, better way to go about things. But um, our economics are such that one of these old wells completed in half the zones we're looking at would have paid for one of our new wells with twice the zones they produce from. Um, what the advantage, the main advantage of our, of our West Five Mile and our adjacent programs in this area is that we, we this is unprecedented in, in the oil business, we eliminate the risk of finding oil and gas. It is absolutely there. It is consistently there and predictably there. Um, our only variable is the price of oil. Uh, and at anything above $40 a barrel, the lease will be profitable. People ask another question, what do these wells go down to over time and when do they stop being economic? On an individual basis, these wells will be economic if they make 10 gallons of oil a day, one quarter barrel a day, they'll still be economic at $75 oil. Additionally, we produce gas with the oil. Gas is measured in MCF, 1,000 cubic feet. Uh, that's the measure, uh, that's a unit of how much gas you sell. Right now, an MCF of gas is selling for about $2.40. With each well that's making, for instance, 10 barrels a day, we can count on making about 20 to 25 MCF a day, or approximately 50 to $70 a day in gas per well. Now, when you multiply that times 40 wells, you're looking at uh, $2,800 a day in gas revenue. Over the course of a month, you're looking at about $73,000, $74,000. And this is sufficient, more than sufficient, to pay the operating expenses of the lease. When the oil is sold, the refineries send out checks directly to the interest owners. 
There is not uh, any sort of filtering of the of the production through us, the operator. There is a, a complete openness about how much oil was produced, when it was picked up, the price per barrel when it was picked up, and your your royalty interest. That's shown on every check stub. And um, the only place where we would extract operating cost would be the gas, not the oil. We get one gas check per lease. We strip out the operating costs, which are uh, $200 per well per month, or on, the, on a unit basis, this would be about um, uh, $200 per unit if you have one unit in the project per month. And uh, the rest of the gas is then distributed to uh, the royalty owners, the partners. So it's a, it's a very um, non-complex, it, it's a, a beautiful in its simplicity. We drill the wells at industry prices. The actual well cost is in the book, broke by every expense. And your royalty is never diminished. Uh, it will never change. It is your property. You can keep it or sell it, pass it down. Um, it cannot be taken from you. And uh, it will be assigned to you in a deed as if it were a piece of property, which in effect it is. So the the projects will also and always be available for anybody to come out during any time of the operation and visit with the field personnel, uh, visit with the operator. I'll be out there very often during the logging and completion of the wells. And I've met many of our vesting partners at, um, at our other projects. And um, you know, I, I don't recommend you come out in January. Buffalo and points southeast of there can be a little daunting then. But um, once the weather improves in the spring and um, we are going full steam on our projects, that would be a great time to start visiting if you care to. Yeah, very well said, uh, Kevin. I appreciate uh, taking the time and Thank and you. and just to reiterate some of the things he said. Uh, Stephen Ford, the operator, uh, uh, Vertical Energy. Uh, he's the operator. He's the driller, and uh, he's drilled and operated over fifteen hundred wells uh, yeah. in the region. And Kevin has uh, 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 drilled three hundred wells, and between the both of them, uh, just under two thousand wells drilled and operated in this region. So. Uh, to say that they have experience is an understatement. And they've only had, a, a, a what, five dry holes between? Uh, combined. And those were mechanical combined. failures. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, so virtually um, the risk of drilling a dry hole is less than 1%. Um, and, and, and Stephen has his own rig. There's only 600 active rigs in the U.S. right now, and he has one of 600. Yeah. And most of your active rigs are with the big oil companies, Chevron, uh, 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 you know, British Petroleum, the, the, the ones that are on the stock exchange that you don't have the ability to invest directly with to get the tax benefits. So very few smaller operations like Stephen Ford offering tax benefits that actually have their own rig, which is why it's economically feasible out here uh, because he's not at the mercy of hiring out a drilling team and the schedule, okay? And so uh, there's 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 tremendous benefits uh, in this. And I mean, this is a veteran oil deal and these are the deals that I look for. But uh, all right, guys, uh, I, I'm Sean Pruitt and uh, this is Kevin Fowler. We're signing off here. If you're interested in learning more, uh, go in the description below. My contact information will, will be in there. If you wanna get a hold of me or if you wanna get a hold of Kevin Fowler or even Stephen Ford, feel free to look in the description below and reach out to us. Until then, thanks for your time and we'll talk soon. Thanks everyone.